Hello, this is V-Disc Daddy, sharing with you some of the history of the records you're listening to on YouTube. The V-Disc program started in June 1941, six months before the United States' involvement in World War II, when Captain Howard Bronson was assigned to the Army's Recreation and Welfare Section as a musical advisor. Bronson, who had spent time previously in John Philip Sousa's marching band, suggested the troops might appreciate a series of records featuring military band music or inspirational records that could motivate soldiers and improve morale. By 1942, Armed Forces Radio Service sent 16-inch 33 RPM shellac transcript discs to the troops, mostly radio shows with commercials edited out. These records arrived safely as opposed to the shellac records their mothers and girlfriends sent over. Eighty percent were broken by the time they reached the soldiers. Meanwhile, the American Federation of Musicians, led by James Cesar Petrillo, were planning to go on strike. Union members were not receiving compensation for music played on the radio or in juice boxes. Petrillo told the four major record companies, RCA Victor, DECA, Columbia, and Capitol, that unless the AFM members received a higher royalty payment to compensate for those losses, the union would produce no more records after July 31st, 1942. The companies refused the increase and started stockpiling performances and concerts, hoping the strike would be short. It lasted for two years. During the strike, musicians would give concerts and radio broadcasts but no recorded music. Now Lieutenant George Robert Vinson enters the picture. Having fought in World War I as a 17-year-old lieutenant, Vince had a long association with both the armed forces and, the rec and recorded music. He had also worked with Thomas Edison, designing improvements to the phonograph. By 1942, he rejoined the Army and assigned, was assigned to the Armed Forces Radio Service as a technical officer. Vince knew the soldiers wanted to hear new music. He asked his supervisor if a special recording project could be undertaken to provide those new songs to the troops. July 1943, Vince discussed the project with Major Bronson, who okayed it, but told Vince that there was no money in the Army budget to start a record company. Vince met with Major Howard Haycraft, the Army's fiscal officer, who immediately allocated $1 million to Vince's new project. Vince devoted all his time to the music programs. He recruited Steve Scholl, who formerly with RCA Victor, uh, to assist him. Vince's company now had a name, V-Disc, a phrase coined by Vince's secretary, and a logo, red, white, and blue graphic design by a staff artist at Yank Magazine on a $5 retainer. The first problem was to find a suitable replacement for shellac. Four out of five discs arrived cracked. When the Japanese took over French Indonesia, America lost its supply of imported shellac. Although shellac could be recycled and reused, the music was drowned out by the loud surface noise of the recycled discs. 
After much testing, vinyl light, a union carbide product, was used as a viable substitute for shellac. The Army also used vinyl light for insulation and life rafts. So a second resin, Formvar, a Canadian invented polyvinyl, was used. Columbia refused to use either compound, making their V-disc out of whatever shellac they could find. After Steve Scholes joined the V-Disc program, two other enlisted men signed on. Monty Perfect Pitch Pallets and Walt Hebner. Walt Hebner's job was to convince the AFM and Petrillo to grant a special waiver to record the V-Disc for the Army. On October 27th, 1943, Petrillo wrote Hebner back telling him the AFM imposed no objections to the making of these records. The letter also carried with it permission for those members of the AFM who are desirous of doing so to volunteer their services for the making of such recordings. There were some conditions, though. Because of the AFM strike, Petrillo asked that the records not be used for any commercial purposes, that the records not be sold, and that all the Vetus were to be destroyed after the war. For the first time in over 15 years, Tommy, Dor Tommy Dorsey's orchestra would share the same recording with his brother, Jimmy Dorsey, March 15, 1945. Frank Sinatra on V-Disc 722, That Old Black Magic, gives an introduction. Frank Sinatra recorded close to 70 in all at the request of the GIs. Life Magazine did an article on the V-Disc program on October 11th, 1943. Fats Waller's last recordings were done on V-Disc, as well as Tommy Dorsey, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, with guest Judy Garland. In future recordings, we'll give you information detailing other V-Discs and special information on the performances and the performers given at that time. Thank you.